A continuación por HBO. to Michael, a sleeping baby. How do you like the trip, Michael? So now you have me, your cameraman, and I good or my badge. Where I'll have that in 5.5 seconds. school when my, uh, my dad called me and told me that Evan had jumped out of, out of his window. I 
went into my mother's room and I realized the sentence that had to come out of my mouth. I had to communicate to them why I was coming in there and why I was reaching out for them. And, you know, I had to say, Evans killed himself. that you do, I think, or at least that I do, unconsciously, to avoid things that are really too painful to confront, is just block them out. How, how can you understand doing that? It doesn't seem possible. What on earth has happened to make your son so miserable that he doesn't want to be there anymore? We'll never know what was in Evan's head the night he killed himself. The mystery will always be what his thought was when he was on the ledge. You know, as he put one foot over the, the window and made that decision. Maybe he started to realize that his mental illness was so powerful and that he couldn't win. He that raised up Jesus from the dead will also give life to our mortal bodies. In the sure and certain hope of the resurrection to eternal life for our Lord Jesus Christ, we command to Almighty God our brother Evan, and we commit his body to the ground, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. Amen. How is it possible that I found myself at his funeral holding my baby for the last time? indescribable it, it was indescribable happiness to finally see him because when you're when you're pregnant you start to have a relationship with the baby and it's like moving around and you know who are you, you know knock knock who's there and then he comes out and uh, Evan was particularly pretty I just fell in love with him right away I actually filmed Evan getting born, and I was very excited. And so I recall I gave the camera to the doctor, and then he did a shot also. I 
I was 26 when Evan was born. Hart was 42. He already had a son from a previous relationship. But Evan was my first. Hart and I are filmmakers, and at that time, Hart was shooting away a lot. He was gone a lot of the time. So Evan and I ended up being alone together. He was young. I was young. We were like these two little creatures trying to help each other out a little bit. Okay, we, we want to have an interview with the mom. So, mom, what do you think about your kid? Kid? Oh yeah, this one. Well, I think that I think that it's really just the most special thing to do big kisses. Really, I think that's the best part of it all. I remember the first time I met Evan. Dana had come home from the hospital. I think I had actually been away with my mother while he was born, and my dad came and picked me up at my apartment. I was living on Mercer Street with my mom, and he said, we're going to meet your little brother. There's this photograph of me um, taken during my first encounter with Evan, and my expression sort of sums it all up. It's, what the fuck is this? <laughs> sort of holding this baby in my arms, thinking, you know, where did he come from? So, so what's, who's your brother? Nikki. Do you like your brother, Nikki? Yeah. So how old are you, Evan? Um, I'm oh. old, I older. I'm You're older, how old? Um, way old. Look at daddy, look at daddy's camera when you say that. I'm way old. You're really old? How old? Wait. Big old. Are you big? Yeah. How big are you? T Real big? Big as a dinosaur? I remember his first word that he used over and over and over again was no. And we used to joke it was no because he heard the word no so much because as soon as he was walking around, he would get into everything. <laughs> I think I understood from an early time that he was a challenging kid. Russell, Russell. Getting dressed in the morning I knew was a challenge. If he didn't have the right outfit, you know, you weren't going to be leaving the house for a very long time. One summer, we were in Nantucket, and we were trying to leave the beach at the end of the day, and I think it took us 45 minutes to get the towels in the baskets and start walking home from the beach because Evan wanted the towels to be folded a certain way and put in the basket a certain way, and if they weren't, he would dump them out in the sand, and he'd say, start over, start over. That was his big phrase. He was a perfectionist, and this persisted throughout his whole life. If he wasn't absolutely the best at something, then he would get frustrated. And discipline was pretty much impossible. I mean, the way we used to handle it is we'd say, okay, so you have time out. We put him in his room. Well, you put him in his room for time out. It's like, you know, Keith Moon in a hotel room. You know, the TV <laughs> sets out the window, <laughs> bookshelves are, you know, crashing over and you come in and it's like totally destroyed and do you think he's uh, at all uh, you know feels bad about it no it's like okay so put me in prison I want to go to prison there was no doubt in my mind that he had psychological issues I guess the best way I can describe it is he lacked emotional shock absorbers and because of that would react to situations that you and I would see as insignificant in a really, really big way. Well, really, it was almost like there were two Evans. He would be, on the one hand, tantruming and being completely impossible to reach. On the other hand, being this wonderful, vibrant, vivacious kid. My name is Robocop. What's yours? Nobody. Well, I'm pulling you over, nobody, because you're speeding. 
He's up on the throttle. Okay, good night. Have sweet dreams. Goodbye. <laughs> I mean, he was so much fun to be around. And when Michael was born, Evan was thrilled. He finally had a playmate. They were roommates. And he adored Michael. Hi, it's me, Evan. That's my little brother, and that's my mom. And what are they doing? My mom's talk, trying to talk to somebody. Michael's just sucking on his pacifier. I couldn't take him out because that was too hard to open. Okay, what's, what's Michael saying? He's saying that I want to get that dog. That's what he's saying. Okay, Evan, you want to film now? Yeah. Okay. And that's formula. There's a green shirt. Guess who? It's Daddy. Four eyes. Oh, there's inside the toilet. And there's under the bed. Let's go see. We see red gloves. We see some socks. Ready? I'm ready. Okay. Action. He learned how to read very quickly. He loved books. He loved talking about what he was reading. And he was a great companion you know, when you were doing something, going on a trip. He was a guy who was, you know, good for an adventure. Evan was incredibly affectionate. He was very physical, very cuddly, always sort of cuddling up. Ev, are you a little baby still in mommy's tummy? Huh? You haven't even been born yet, have you? You have to take that intense sweetness and you know sensitivity and just completely upend it into the darkest, scariest. Uh, scary. Scary, that's all I can say. Scary person, scary soul, the darkest of souls. When Evan was in kindergarten, I got a call from the after school teacher. She was really concerned about him talking about suicide. I met Evan when he was five, and he came to our program, performing arts school, and um, He's probably the cutest kid I've ever seen. You try not to have favorites, but sometimes it just happens, and he happened to be all the teacher's favorite. He was just one of the most loving, creative kids I've ever met. Very righteous, and everything had to be fair. And if someone was giving anyone a hard time, he would be the first one to break it up and say, do you think that was fair? It wasn't fair. But when he was five and he was in the younger group, he was obsessed with dying. You know, jumping out the window and saying, I'll kill myself. And he said a relative had done that. Every day in group, he would bring that up. And he would say, I want to jump out the window. But say, I don't care if I die. I don't care. And I said, well, what about me? And he said, well, I'd feel bad for you and my parents, but I wouldn't mind because I won't feel anything. And he would sit on my lap and have his arm, you know, around me, and he would talk about it. He said, no, I, I, would, I would jump out, you know, like, I'm like, you know, without being upset, without, you know, just being loving and affectionate. And I said, Evan, that's just weird talk, all right? You know, come on, that's, that's just weird. I've seen depressed kids, and I've seen, you know, hyper kids, but not kids who talk about, you know, dying. He was just curious about death and even obsessed with it. The thing about Evan's obsession with death was that it was so matter of fact. A lot of times it was just casual. Um, we're in Hawaii. We were just snorkeling. I saw, uh, we saw an eel, a 
Like, I remember one time in, in Hawaii, we're just there, snorkeling or something, and he says something like, by the way, I've, I've got a rifle. Don't say this at home. <laughs> so? What? I got a rifle. You got a rifle? Yeah. What do you need a rifle for? To shoot you. And you just go, what? What do you need to shoot? I mean, that's not really funny. It's not really expressed in a, in a way that seems attention-getting. It seems like, yeah, this is what I think about. 1997, Evan Perry, perfectionistic, obsessive, doesn't like to have things, I stopped writing there, good athlete, popular. When he was five, we did start seeing a psychiatrist. Doing well in school last year fighting etc and very early on he diagnosed depression in Evan and put him on Prozac we talked about Prozac September 25th 97 that was the heyday of where people were just really discovering depression in children you know before I don't know when when I started out training people didn't really think children had depression it was just thought children don't get depressed. Period. Well, I think I remember when right? you prescribed Prozac, I was pretty surprised. That was, I'd never yeah, heard of that. That was like a really big thing. Positive, strong family history of depression on both sides. Should I say this part? Or yeah, skip sure. this. Parental uncle committed suicide, age 21. Your brother. Yeah. Talks about death and murder. He was just scary. I don't know what to say. He had already made a suicide attempt. Which one? Ran to window and threatened to jump in front of parents, I wrote. Defiant, rebellious, banged head, threatened to kill parents and brother. I want cancer. Well, he was such a baby, you know, in the beginning. He had such a baby face. Yeah. And he was such a kind of, kind of pink, kind of baby kid. And then it was uh, this, that kind of visual contrast between the, you know, the demons inside him and that kind of sweet look. At one point, I'd say Evan was about maybe seven or eight. He and I were home. And once again, he started to talk about wanting to kill himself. There were a lot of times where he would tell me specifically what he was going to do. He was going to jump out the window, he was going to jump off a building, he was going to cut himself, or in this particular occasion, he was going to hang himself. He took this pillow thing with a strap on it and climbed up on his bunk bed, and he fixed it up there. And then he put it around his neck, and he showed me how he was going to jump off the bunk bed. He's going to show Mom how he's going to hang himself right in front of her and I didn't let him but I'm tired of trying to explain to people what I'm hearing at home and I'm just gonna record this I always felt so guilty about taking those pictures but I was so tired of explaining to people my son wants to kill himself I just needed some kind of proof that, um, that this is really happening because it was so impossible to believe. Oh, God. Is this someone trying to hang himself? Yeah. You know, there was a uh, idea that children could not be suicidal because they didn't understand that death was um, irreversible. Um, I never really felt like I knew Evan very well. Um, he was the scariest kid I ever saw in my life. I'd never seen a kid who had been this, was this intent on uh, death. It felt to me always like there was a mask or something there. And I remember that look going over him, that unreachable look. When Evan went through mood swing, his whole body changed. His face changed, his, his physical attitude changed, his ability to communicate changed, and you literally saw it in his face. 
he became unreachable. Hart and I started to call it the fugue state. He'd sort of go like this. The physical change would be like a slackening of his face. It just wasn't engaged. Something receded. And what you had was this kind of thing, this facade. There's a tone of voice that went along with it too, a very flat tone of voice. He definitely acted like a teenager at a very young age. He seemed to have skipped being a kid and gone immediately to being a adolescent. How's the football game yesterday? That's the kind of thing you expect from your 15-year-old. You know, you're not the boss of me, and come on, give me the car keys, and where are you going out? You know, what would you do in school? Nothing. I mean, that seems normal. In a seven-year-old, it doesn't seem normal. And he was very teenage. He was, uh, along with that, though, he's also very sophisticated. This my hour. Absolute power. He did not have a Britney Spears phase. He did not have a Backstreet Boys phase. He went straight to Dylan, Neil Young, Nirvana, and he wrote a lot of songs. Should have been, could have been, would have been dead if I didn't get the message going on in my head. You asked me how, I told you. You said, wow, well, take it now since you learned it, not how. His lyrics touched on things that you can't imagine a kid that young would even think about. He kept a journal, and I saw it and took it out and started reading it. And there were these poems in it, essentially saying, I'm prepared for death, I'm not afraid of death, these really deep poems. And I was probably 15, 16, and going through my moody phase. And I remember thinking, wow, these are thoughts I'm having right now. I felt there was something really powerful going on in his mind that he had a sensitivity and maturity that was way beyond his years. There's one play that Evan wrote, and his character was a depressed kid who just saw the negativity in everything. Hey, kid. Yeah? It's not raining anymore. Just give it some time. Just give it some time. We'll start up again. When he was 10, he said, let's do a play about someone dying, a boy dying. I said, well, what kind of story is that? He said, what? It's a story about a kid dying and all his friends and they miss him. How am I supposed to live without you? You are my big brother. Who's going to take care of me? Walk me to school. Calm me down when I'm 
upset. Please, don't leave me. We'll be there for you. It will be okay. I'll walk you to school. I can't leave him. Evan came up with a story that didn't make any sense. Just someone died. And, you know, that they cry. You said you would always be there for me. Well, I need you more than I ever have right now. I think he wanted the play to be about the boy dying, which obviously was his character, and to be able to see it in a play that everybody loves him. I know that. When you leave, it's like that's when everyone gets together and they miss you and they honor you. He will always be with us. You don't have to look here or in heaven. Look in your heart and he'll be there. So we decided to do the show and that's when, um, you know, Evan attempted or came close to attempting suicide at PS11. The fall semester of 2000, when Evan was in fifth grade, he communicated to the principal of his school that he felt suicidal. We get a letter, and of course, you know, I suggest a psychological evaluation. Well, I'm already in therapy. I'm already seeing a psychiatrist who's already on meds. I don't know, you know, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. And three weeks later, he made an attempt at school. I got a call at my office. This is Mr. Delmonico from PS11. This is about Evan. He said, it's, it's very serious. Um, you need to get here. And I'm like, you have to tell me what's going on. He said, he's up on the roof of his school, PS11. It's probably six stories. And he took a chunk of pavement about the size of a hamburger and threw it down onto the, the playground where the other kids were. One of the teachers went out on the roof and there was Evan perched on the ledge and Evan told him that he wanted to kill himself, that he was going to jump. The teacher told him that life was worth living and what was good about Evan and that he was loved and eventually Evan came down on his own. By the time I, I got there, he had been brought down into the principal's office and we were there in the principal's office and we decided to go straight from there to an emergency room. One of the residents asked him, do you know what it's like to be dead? He says, yeah, everybody gathers around and talks about how great you were. And for me, it was like, this is my worst fear. He is like my brother. My younger brother, Scott, committed suicide by asphyxiating himself in a car. Because of my experience with my brother, I wasn't going to fool around. We had Evan involuntarily committed to a mental institution because uh, we were very, very concerned about his suicide attempt. We took it very seriously. The place he went was called Four Winds. It's outside of New York, and it's a lockup psychiatric facility. Evan was brought in by ambulance after having an incident at school. Um, he was brought to the Deerfield unit, which is the unit uh, I was working on at the time, which is for kids 8 to 12, and immediately assessed and evaluated. We were able to establish a, uh, a pattern and saw that he definitely uh, met the criteria for bipolar disorder. You know, known historically as manic depression, this is a chemical imbalance, a chemical illness in the brain. Some kids have more of a propensity towards depression and some kids have more of a propensity towards mania. I think in Evan's case it was definitely more depression. Bipolar depression is definitely more severe than just depression. And that's why suicide attempts are more common in kids with bipolar depression and that's why it's scarier because you don't know how far he'll take it. You know, you don't know if he actually would have jumped off that ledge at school. You know, he had a tendency to blame other people or other situations instead of being able to say, okay, yeah, I get it. I did something I probably shouldn't have done. It scared a lot of people, and 
that's why I'm here. He just sort of said all I wanted was someone to listen. And he just couldn't understand that his behaviors and the, the measures that he took were scary to people. He didn't think that if he went and stood on the, uh, the roof of school that anything would happen. So when he ended up in a hospital where it's locked down and they watch you every second and you're not allowed to do anything unless it's part of the schedule and there's these other damaged kids and your, your parents can only visit once in a while, he just broke down. I mean, he just fell apart. He fell apart. He was destroying property on the unit. He was very, very angry. At one point, I remember he drew all over his walls in his room, and we had to have him clean his walls. He also was tantruming a lot. He was angry a lot. He was banging his head and his arms up against a wall. When he was in the throes of a manic episode or a depressive episode, you know, you couldn't reason. And you can't reason with a kid who's bipolar. Visiting Evan at Four Winds was agonizing. Here is a kid who lives in a lockup psychiatric facility for seriously mentally ill kids. And coming to terms with your kid who seemed to have behavioral issues, but he could have just, you know, be like an adolescent, that this is something you'd go through because he had so many really, you know, charming, bright qualities. Four Winds was uh, a real body punch. Evan was given a variety of medications. Depakote was one of them. Uh, he seemed really doped up. And then they suggested that he try lithium. Lithium is a mood stabilizer, and it is used to level off the serotonin in the brain, as opposed to having the highs and lows to kind of even off the chemistry. He really did start to respond to lithium. I mean, it was really pretty remarkable. But he was still, you know, profoundly ill. So then the question became like, well, what do we do after this? PS11 would not take him back, and there was no place for him to go, uh, except for this very expensive alternative, which turned out to, I think, have saved his life for a number of years. Suzanne Hanna, who was his therapist, recommended this place called Wellspring, which was what they call milieu therapy. Everything's an opportunity to learn how to live in the group, from doing the dishes and making the meals to taking care of animals to taking care of younger children to chores and things like that. Evan came to us from Four Winds Hospital, and they were pretty adamant that the bipolar disorder was um, managed medication-wise and that he was on the proper dosages and uh, that seemed to be the case on some level we saw and then right away within a few days Evan decided to venture off campus and uh, obvious question at that point was was it really controlled three days in he decided that he wasn't gonna have it you know that this whole thing about the adults being in charge really wasn't for him he made it a little bit more complicated than he had to, like built in a little dramatic effect. He went out a window. He could have went out the door. We're not, doors aren't locked. Oh, I see. So he went out the window and then went on the roof and then jumped down. So this was like, that involved some doing. Dana gets a phone call from Evan that he's climbed out a window and escaped from Wellspring and is in some guy's house. Of course, we had to go to juvenile court because the guy whose house he broke into uh, press charges. I think the neighbor whose house he was in was quite unforgiving. You know, luckily he didn't do anything with that man's house that day, but he was trying to get a rise out of his parents to come rescue him, show them just how much he's suffering, and he'll go home and stir it all up again and be back in the hospital again in, a, you know, another year. It was as if he was in a game. It was an important event. And it really kind of marked that need for a switch, that, that Evan really needed to be held accountable for the relational damage he was doing. So that event was a microcosm of what had happened in his life. He wasn't being held accountable on some level for the damage he did to you all. I think the first night we were here, he sat right here, right? Yeah. As I recall, um, he had us in first and kind of gave us a little heads up, and then Evan came in and had us I think sit on his sit on our laps right. and, and he told him you to tell, talk to him really honestly. Right. 
and I did. And it was, it was like this incredible relief because I had permission to say what I was feeling without being afraid of breaking him. You know? I remember. And you, you were like, really? <laughs> yeah, I was like, really? Well, if I tell him that I'm afraid I'm going to find him dead, he'll explode. Right. And the world will end, and, you know, all this stuff will come rushing out, and it will be poisonous, right. and we won't be able to survive it. And I think to, to all of our amazement, right. we not only survived, but started building, you know, on that. Finally, he started to work with the therapy at Wellspring. And slowly, bit by bit, he started to come around to their philosophy. We came frequently for, you know, sessions where we learned how to communicate as a family with Evan and with his unique needs. It was like learning a new language. They basically say that children are responsible for their actions. Let's put it really simply. If you make a mess, you clean it up. Whether it's a physical mess, like you've spilled something, you need to clean it up, or an emotional mess. I remember coming here and seeing uh, Evan working on that stone wall over there. For a child to think they cleaned up their mess and they made something a little better, rather than feeling like you were punished or you had consequences or whatever. But in this case, you get to feel like you really repaired something yeah. and maybe yeah. it's even better than it was before. I think what happened at Wellspring is that they encouraged Evan to be a boy. I think a lot of their philosophy is to let children be children. When he came, he was kind of running the show. You know, he was in adult conversations and he would much prefer being with the staff than he would with the other kids. He really needed to be a kid again and just have fun and relax and, and forget about all those bigger issues. Especially for Evan, who was really acting like such a teenager at such a young age. It was a miracle to see him get past that facade of I'm too cool and to just be a pure boy. And I remember a time seeing him at Wellspring playing in the yard with pure boyness, that boy essence, which is what you need at that age. It's a beautiful day, you're throwing a ball with your friends. Early on, I'd say in, in the first four weeks or so, he began to earn weekend passes. So the weekend of Michael's birthday, he finally did get released and he was at the birthday party and I remember looking at him and thinking, oh, he looks like a boy. The old Evan would have been too cool. He would have been turning up his nose. He would have been sneering. He wouldn't have in a million years let the clown paint his face. Okay, never. He allowed himself to be a kid. I, I saw those sort of layers peel away. And a lot of it had to do with how strict the counselors were. They weren't having it. Evan could try to talk his way out of anything. And Dan's just saying, I'm not going anywhere. Remember, you know, bipolar disorder is not just a disorder of mood, it's a disorder of judgment. And for kids, that's so debilitating if the adults don't hold them close and make them responsible. What he needed to know is that you guys were in charge, and then he could build from your judgment. And that's what he allowed us to do first, because he looked around and he said, OK, I'm not getting over on these guys. I'll let that happen. And then we obviously bridged that to you. It was one of the shortest stays we've really ever had uh, of a boy with so much going on in his life. Three months is really an unusual time to get all that done. By the time Evan finished at Wellspring, the lithium had definitely kicked in. Along with the therapy, it was working, and you couldn't have one without the other. He seemed well enough to rejoin our family. The whole family went to Wellspring, and we all learned. And when it was over, here we had this kid again, and what did we do with him? So we decided to see whether we could get him into a mainstream school, which was sensitive to kids who had issues. So we got him into a school called York Prep, and suddenly everything was different. We would get a report card, and he was like one of the best students in the class. The teachers were saying, I wish all my students were like Evan. He got the prize in the science project. So what's this? My science fair. It's about how to make a hologram. Can I get the ribbon? There's... <laughs> a ribbon! It's so hard. They move so fast. And we don't have like 40 pictures of digital camera. None of them work. It's like natural change. 
one of the great things about Evan going to York is he found such a great group of friends. It took a while for him to like kind of gain your trust and stuff like that. And um, after a while, it was he was just one of those people I could talk to about anything and come to him with any problem. Once we started hanging out, I started like you know figuring out his interest in toys, and I really liked toys. Like toys was my thing, and toys was his thing. And cartoons were his thing. And cartoons were my thing. Well, he was definitely different from all the other kids we hung out with. Nobody seemed to have strong opinions like him. He was really set in his ways, and once he had an idea, he wasn't going to let it go. A lot of stuff people say in high school, they don't really mean, or they're just trying to be popular. But, like, you know, Evan, he would just go right into it. He wouldn't hold back. What I liked about Evan was that he uh, was really creative and like, was interested in a lot of things that, like not, like, not just TV. Like, a lot of kids were just watching TV, and he was making TV. <laughs> Kevin had various, you know, movie ideas. When he was younger, he wrote me into shooting them. Guys, shut up! Okay, ready? Three, two, one, action. Hi, I'm Adam Woot, and I'm here to host a new reality TV show titled, What It Takes to Be an Astronaut. There's a certain amount of chaos that was involved in the creation of them. All right, redneck, and then Gabe, you have to say something. We have a Chinese ADD, don't forget. I go to space all the time. Space is, space is, no grandma tea. No, okay, I'm not Chinese, because it's too hard to be Chinese. Okay? You're Chi you have ADD, where's the ADD? Right. ADD, ADD, no Chinese. No. <laughs> Do you know how long it took us just to get through these three lines? That's all you did. I'm just trying to play a little more serious, okay? You, who are you supposed to be? It doesn't matter. Really, <laughs> at this point, it doesn't matter. I want to do. I want to do the whole thing over again. What do you mean the whole thing? Because I was. Yo, hey, what are you talking about? Yes. I say yo, man. Oh, you want to go back? All the films we were making were all disasters. We always got too excited about them because, like, we'd have microphones, we'd have a nice camera, and we'd, like, talk about it and talk about it and talk about it, and then we, we just wouldn't finish it. There was a summer I went to the New York Film Academy and asked me to be in one of his movies. The assignment was to shoot uh, in black and white and no sound. He made a movie about me waking up in a world with no sound and no color. anything wrong with him. He took medication. I had no idea. Never brought it up. Never talked about it. Sometimes we got a little suspicious because like he would just be really quiet for a long period of time, but we just got accustomed to it because he did it a lot. He would miss school every now and then. Like, I can tell. I knew. And I, I, would, like, I would tell him he's on his period because he's like, he looks like he, you know, he would have a month where he's just like moping around. And then he would have a month where he's like really happy, really happy, and he would tell me like, listen, the more happy I get, the more pissed off I'm gonna get later. One time, I think, going out to the roof, I remember him sitting on the ledge, like, uh, and it really like scared me, and he just seemed to be completely fearless, like almost willing to just walk, like walk on the edge, and like I really like kind of like yelled at him, like, get, get down from the edge, you know? Like, that's like not something you do, and it just, he kind of distanced himself like that, and, like, it's almost like showing showing me, like, I don't really care. We talked about it a little bit. He always sort of brushed it away, and he sort of said, but I'm over that now. And we all thought he was, he was pretty good, and he always acted really great. And there were no real signs of any, like, real depression or anything. I was totally optimistic about his health and the direction that he was going to go. When I'd come home from school and spend holidays, I remember remarking to myself, you know, this is a much more warm, loving household than it was two years earlier. I guess that's what I saw after Wellspring, that Dana and my father really showing him that 
within our family lies a really strong foundation that he can trust. And during that time, it really did seem like everything was under control. As the years went by after Wellspring, and he continued to be the top student in his class, he continued to have good friends, that there weren't any big issues. I thought that maybe he was cured. You know, maybe he's going to have a life. You know, I'd go with Evan to visit his older brother at college, and Evan was, like, looking at college and thinking, well, I can do it. I can have a life like this. You know, as the years proceeded, I was not thinking that maybe the telephone was going to ring. I was thinking that, hey, this kid, this, this kid is different from my brother. He's got a shot. My brother, there'd never really been a diagnosis. He was a successful suicide. And that was my big fear about Evan. From an early age, both Scott and Evan, they were overwhelmed by their emotions. With my brother, you know, I'd learned how to, you know, be his guide. You know, we went to the same school, we went to the same college, we were very close. And I'd been my brother's keeper up until the point really where he started living with Martine, his girlfriend. Well, Scott was fun. He was brilliant. He was very creative. He was a great skier. He was an athlete. We went skiing together. We really had a lot of fun, and I was totally seduced when I met him. I knew he was taking medication all along, and I knew he was seeing a psychiatrist. He was getting some help. I never really, I had absolutely no experience with depression before I met Scott. So I knew that there was a problem, but I didn't really see it because Scott was always very optimistic and he was very outgoing. But I think I started noticing something after the first year. He had mood swings, he had ups and downs. At the second year, he tried to kill himself a couple of times while he was with me. I was supposed to get up in the morning and find him dead next to me. And he was amazed when he woke up. I assume he didn't take enough. You know, he was trying to overdose with medication and maybe with drugs, heroin. After he, his two attempts, he was really able to talk about it and communicate about it. And I could really understand as much as I could the depth of the desperation. He said he was in a hole, yeah. in a tunnel, in a hole. There was no way out. The pain was so profound. He, he could not imagine going on with it and living with it. Even though I was there, it, it did not matter. Me and his family were not enough to keep him alive. At those moments of such despair and pain, the only way out was to die. I don't like to think that maybe I wasn't really clued into what was going on, though I probably wasn't, because I wasn't willing to accept the fact that uh, anything so terrifying to me could be on the way. And particularly because Scott didn't seem like a, an unhappy person. All it tells you is that there is so much more to know about people you love than you can ever really uncover. What happened that weekend when, when Scott died? I don't know. No, nope, I have not the faintest idea. Not the faintest idea. You found him. But what? You found him. Who found him? You found him. I found him. Mm. I don't remember doing that. No. What's more, I think I can get along without memory. I don't remember at all. I think it was a Saturday. We came for the weekend up here, 4th of July weekend. Scott was totally normal, fun, nice. 
suddenly we, you know, it was a beautiful afternoon and we said, where is Scott? Scott was not around. I knew something was wrong. So I said to Billy, well, I'm going to go to the caretaker's house and see if the gun is still there. Because I knew that the caretaker had guns and Scott knew that he had guns. So I went there and Billy went in another direction. I couldn't get inside the house because it was locked. I don't exactly remember, but I knew he didn't have the guns. When I came back, I so Bibi came back and her lipsticks were smeared around her mouth and she said, I just found Scott. And she found him in the Jeep, in the car, near the carriage house. And what he had done was take the hose from the vacuum cleaner and put the hose from the exhaust pipe inside the car. died, I decided to make a film. It was too painful for me to like really deal with his suicide. So I made the film about a uh, sculptor friend of my mother's who came from Spain to make a sculpture for the grave. I documented the process of making the sculpture and the installation. I thought that maybe in the course of making the film, I could find some meaning about my brother's suicide. about seven, eight years to come back to normal. I was mutilated when he died. I was mutilated. Half of me was dead. Completely dead. parents were shattered. It was like broken glass. Shattered. don't exist to tell another person how destroyed part of you has been. They just don't exist. I can't tell you, but I can tell you that it's something you never recover from. What is true is that life goes on, but not the way you wanted it to and not the way you planned for it to, but you don't recover. I don't think. I thought if everyone was going to kill himself, it'd be similar to my experience with my brother. It was like a slow decline. But Evan seemed to be actually doing pretty well. Hey. Light. 
So why are you out so late? Well, I'm just seeing a kiss concert, man. Kiss rules! Kiss rocks! Rocks! Daddy, rocks! Daddy, rocks! rocks! She said, now oh. watch him wait. Hey! Hey! Get in the bag. Yeah. I just want to wait. Run, run, Mike. Run, Evan. You know, I mean, Evan was never, you know, like an over-the-top, you know, effervescent, happy kid. But from all the the markers, is he getting into trouble? No, not at all. Can you do the fish? Fish! Like this? I'll get you in the snake! Oh, oh, oh. I can do the seizure. We seen the police, and we certainly did see the police for a number of occasions before Wellspring. No police. I'm a douche. Take it with me. Evan was doing so well. It was like a miracle. You couldn't believe it. You just couldn't believe it. Is this the same kid? I mean, here he is, and he's growing, and he's popular, and he has these lovely friends, and they have a wonderful time. Suddenly there's hair there and his jaw gets firmer and he's taller than I am and he's a man, he's a young man. Very handsome, very popular with the girls, but not really all that interested in them. His voice went from like this to this. He really hated being sick. We went, we were like, do you hear us yelling outside? We're like, Evan, 3E, 3W, whatever. He didn't want to be different. What teenage boy does? Yeah, yeah so I'll, I'll see you guys there. I just have to wait. Okay, it's just Angela's friend's corner. All right. Bye. I'll see you soon. Bye. Oh, oh, my gosh, what? Uh, the group incident. Why would someone have to Oh, are we talking about this again? Evan. He's like, I'm not like that anymore. Are you better now? Yay. High five. A lot of the time, he seemed really out of it to me. And I really attributed that to his drugs. Because I remember going through a turnstile door with him and him sort of just stopping in the middle or not really paying attention to what was going on around him. And I'd stop and say, what is it with this kid? And I'd say, oh, well, he's taking lithium. We had been talking for a while about trying without the medication because it made him tired, it made his mouth dry. It was really something you didn't want to do. So we said, okay, you know, you, you really want to try this. And he really did. And the doctor said, okay. So he gradually went down in the lithium dose over a course of four to six weeks. March 30th, 2005, lithium 0.56, now subtherapeutic, 1,200 milligrams, didn't take meds for a few days, became, quote, more talkative. At first, decreased lithium was difficult, now fine. He feels better on lower dose. After a while, I wasn't even that convinced, you know, that he really was. I mean, I knew he was bipolar, but he seemed so fine. Also, I remember we talked to him head on. Do you have thoughts of suicide. Do you want to kill yourself? Do you want to harm yourself? And I said, no, you know, I don't. Kids know that if they say certain things or if they do certain things, they're going to be stopped, you know, especially if they have parents who are attentive to what's going on with them. So if a kid really doesn't want to be stopped, he's not going to say anything. Evan may have gotten to the point where he got really just better at masking it externally. But internally, it's a lot of suffering. And this was just the beginning. I mean, it started when he was much younger, and it wasn't going away. We went on vacation for two weeks in Nantucket, and he seemed depressed. He seemed subdued, didn't seem too happy. He wasn't doing good. Then school started. He's sullen, he's depressed. As the weeks unfolded in September, he started getting more anxious about his homework. And at one point, he came to me and he said very seriously, Mom, I need your help. 
I need you to stay after me. We had contacted his psychiatrist and tried to make a meeting as soon as possible to increase his dose of lithium. And we said, let's get him back onto lithium. This experiment didn't work. So we made an appointment with the doctor for the following Tuesday, October 4th. We hung out with him that Friday night. We went to another team called Me and Nick. We invited Evan to go, but he just didn't want to. I mean, it might have been his curfew or whatever. He just didn't want to go. And we didn't think it was that big of a deal. We were just like, whatever. So go home and go. So there was nothing really beforehand that we could have seen. I think if, like, if someone is that sure that they want to do that to themselves, they're going to hide it from someone, you know? The night he died, I came over for dinner. It was a Sunday evening. We're all eating together, and I know Evan had some homework that was unfinished, and he was being a little obnoxious about not wanting to do his homework and started putting his feet on the table and, you know, his mom was nagging him about his homework. And they had a tiff and he was mad. The fight was very intense, as it often was, and, um, you know, really just deeply intense. I was doing the dishes and I was hot, you know. I was tired of this. And he goes up the stairs and he said, Mom, I hate you. And he shuts the door and he locks it. Leaving that night, I didn't think anything of it. He wasn't behaving in any way that would make me think this child is going to end his life tonight. Not in a million, million, million years. I mean, on my good days, I've acted worse than him at dinner. By this time, it was around 10 o'clock. And I went into our bedroom with Mikey, and we were both reading. Just reading for a little bit. And I go to check in on Evan, and he's unlocked the door. I go in, he's sitting in his underwear on his bed with his computer. And, you know, I came over and I said, well, how are you doing? What's, what's happening? And he said, I'm fine, Dad. I'm doing my homework. At his computer, it looked as though he was doing his homework. So I go back to read with Mikey for another five minutes and uh, you know it's Mikey's bedtime so I bring Mikey into the room and Evan's not there I immediately thought that he had jumped out the window but it was an air shaft so you couldn't really see anything Mikey shows up with this little pen light and I shine it down the shaft, and I think I see something, but it's hard to tell. Uh, and I'm starting to, you know, feel pretty concerned at this point. And I run downstairs to find Super, who had access to the air shaft. I guess I was downstairs and uh, about to uh, recline and watch uh, TV, and I was uh, half asleep, I guess. And Nothing unusual, I just heard a noise. And I thought nothing of it. I thought maybe the girl upstairs dropped something. Nothing. Nothing. And I guess, I don't know how many minutes later, uh, somebody came banging on, was banging on my door. We were with Roger, we had the light. I had um, a cell phone and keys. And uh, we went through this labyrinth some kind of way. And Hart got there first. and. Um, and Evan was there, and um, he was on his back, and there was blood. I thought he might be alive, but I f uh, felt his pulse, and he wasn't. So it got pretty chaotic. I was screaming, Evan, 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 Evan. You know, Evan, I just, I please. And I went. And Hart was in front of me, and I said, get out of the way. I want to get him out of the mouth to mouth. I want to get, move, move away. And he said, Dave, 
just go, the paramedics are coming, go upstairs, take care of Michael, take care of what's okay. And he was very calm. I called Nick to come and look after Mikey and Dana, because I had to go to the hospital with, with Evan. I was there comforting Michael, and we were praying. And I thought, maybe he's still live. Maybe it's just broken bones, and maybe he'll live. And um, at some point, I don't know when, but you know, Nick showed up. We pulled up in front of the house. There were police cars outside. It was like, this is fucking real. This is real. And I walked into the apartment, and there were police officers downstairs. You know, they looked at me and started approaching me to say, you know, who are you? And I pushed them out of the way and just ran to Dana. And Michael, what's so amazing, is he kept saying, Mommy's gonna be okay, Mommy's gonna be okay, Mommy's gonna be okay, Mommy's gonna be okay. And we're just holding each other and then, you know, and then heart called and I just knew immediately, I just knew immediately what happened when he was dead. I just go, So then, um, Gene drove me to the hospital, and he was at St. Vincent's, where he had been before. And I was taken <laughs> into the room where he was on the stretcher. And, um, the, um, you know, he wasn't cold, and he had his uh, he had his boxer shorts on. And he took the sheet down like this. And I held him, and um, I closed his eyes. And that's it. And then I got a call in the car from Nick that said, I found his note. I found his note. I remember the officers asking me whether there was a suicide note, and I hadn't even thought about that. And. We looked around his room and there was nothing, and then he pointed to the computer and opened it, touched the screen, and sure enough, a letter came up. To be honest, the gist of the letter was what every fucking 15-year-old thinks about themselves: that I'm not good enough, no one likes me, things won't get better. The difference is, Evan felt that 20,000 times stronger than any normal 15-year-old, and he believed more strongly that things wouldn't get better and that there was no future and living was too painful, too difficult, and death was his only answer. But it was, I mean, verbatim. I could have checked off that list and, you know, if he had showed me that note before he made his decision, I could have gone through it with him and said, Thought that, thought that, thought that. I realize they're all untrue for me. They're definitely all untrue for you. You know, and you know, some of the qualities about yourself that make you feel different right now, you're gonna learn in five years that those are your best qualities. And those are what set you apart from people and make you interesting and attract others to you. But 
you know, that opportunity did not arise. I think that he foresaw, he must have been getting a glimpse of adult life and that he foresaw that he was not going to make it in the way that he wanted to make it. You know, in psychiatry, the bipolar is our cancer. It kills people. You do everything you can. and Some people can't be saved and probably we could have saved Definitely, we could have saved him for a while. But he would have gone off his medication. They all, these kids do, they all go off them. And when he went off, he just went so fast. Maybe his illness was changing into the type where people really do get crazy. He never talked about any of this. Any of that? No. Nope, he never no, talked he about never any, any of this. Of he yeah. denied feeling it. He never talked about any of this. Never did he say anything like... He didn't trust his friends. But this is crazy talk. That's crazy I mean, talk. you know, <clears throat> crazy talk. But it's done so sanely, numbered, and so precise. Yep. This is what makes me so mad with all the portrayals of uh, mental illness that you see on TV and movies. It's like raving, crazy, foaming at the mouth. Not, you know, sanely sitting there, hyper sanely, typing this, you know, horrible thing out. Just, 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 just methodically, already knowing he was going to do it. You know, that's insanity. Evans funeral, I felt that I was going through the same thing again. It was like a repeat. It was the same church. It was the same family. It was that little boy. 35 years later, and Biddy was with me, Scott's mother and Evans' grandmother, and Hart's mother was sitting next to me and holding, hanging on to me. And she would say during the ceremony, she would say, Martin. Why did Scott die? Why did Scott kill himself? And, you know, she knew that she had a son who committed suicide and who died, but she could not remember. I was briefly trying to explain to her that it was the same disease, that he died for the same reasons Evan died. I feel relieved to know that Adam has found peace, even if it means that we must take on pain. Through his memory, we realize the extreme precariousness and preciousness of life. We must cherish and savor the lives we have, the relationships we enjoy, as much as we can, for as long as we can. Time before I go to sleep, 
Sometimes I just, I mean, I can't help but think about them. You don't want to, like, make everything depressed by talking about it every every day, you know? But it's, it's always there, you know? And you can't not talk about it. When I read his note, I could tell that it was spirit of the moment and that hopefully, at least, he didn't mean some of the stuff that he said. His note, it, it didn't come from the other I knew. It was just it's depressing to see him. Horrible stuff he said and about not having friends. And I know, like, he didn't mean it. I got to uh, dig the... You had everything but the hole. Everything but the hole. Yeah. Yeah. I tried to dig the hole. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, who would have told them where to dig it? I don't know how these things work. I don't know. You know? Somebody know. has to mark out where it all is. All right, we'll be. do it. We'll do it. He that raised up Jesus from the dead will also give life to our mortal bodies. In the sure and certain hope of the resurrection to eternal life for our Lord Jesus Christ, we commend to Almighty God our brother Evan, and we commit his body to the ground, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. Amen. Amen. into depression and such incredible pain, there's nothing you can do. <laughs> the survival is really very difficult. But anyway, you do the best you can. What else does, what is there? You know that. There isn't any, there isn't any choice. If you found one, believe me, dearie, pass it along. Because there is no choice. There isn't a choice to cope. There isn't. I have a family. 
the people I love and people who love me. And uh, you really have no choice but to get up and put one foot in front of the other. And um, basically, I think the thing that I think about most is, uh, is I just can't believe it. I can't believe this. I can't believe it. I can't believe I'm sitting here. I can't believe that, um, that I gave birth to this boy and raised him and buried him. I can't believe it. It's just a sense of disbelief. I don't know if I'll ever really understand that it's true, that this really happened. I can't believe it really happened. I mean, it's, tell me it's a dream. I can't believe it. I can't. And I can't believe that the days continue to go by and that, and that the world continues to rotate without him. Oh, nice, dude. Look at us. It's already making towers around it. This is the ground again. I hope this tree grows strong and proud and beautiful to remind us of Evan and always provide beauty and shade for future generations. And that every time we see it, we'll always think of how much we loved him and how we'll always remember him. That's the part that is gonna, I guess, change, which is that as time passes, I'll begin to believe that it's true and that Basically, what I have left of him is those the 15 years that we had, and uh, that there was beauty in that, and joy, and uh, that maybe there's a lesson, or maybe we can learn something, or or communicate something. But um, you know, in terms of coping, it's just you know, it's our choice. I don't have a choice. There is none. this battle. We'll never forget the experience we had at Wellspring. I volunteered to make beans for the barn at Wellspring. I had a farm and a sawmill and it was a way of giving something back to Wellspring that had given us so much. That's going to be a building where other kids are going to be able to get the kind of therapy that Evan got. These beams here, these are ours. All the side beams. And look at that inscription over there. Here was an opportunity to make something physical in memory of Evan. People can say, well, who's Evan? It doesn't matter. What matters is, is that, you know, somebody loved Evan enough to want to remember his name.